Italian wife to invite Professor Paul Atkins to give us an introduction to the material of the paper. Professor Atkins is the department chair of Asian languages and literature, and uh, he teaches medieval Japanese literature, drama, and culture. He earned BA in English and MA and PhD in Japanese from Stanford University, and he has been teaching here at UW since 2002. So, um, and Professor Atkins' recent publications include Heika, The Life and Works of Medieval Japanese Poet, and uh, Revealed Identity, The No Place of Comparative Japanese. These books are available at uh, libraries, of course, and bookstores, too, in case you want to get an old book from him. Uh, so without further ado, Professor Atkins. In the 
early part of the 13th century, the events of the war, namely the rise and fall of the Hague, came to be narrated orally by traveling performers. These storytellers were typically blind men who dressed as Buddhist monks and accompanied themselves on a string instrument called the viwa. Audiences gathered to hear the reciters tell the tale and were moved by the courage of the characters and their tragic fates. And I want to emphasize, it is not only the events that are described in the tale of the Heike that are more than eight centuries old, but the very practice that we are about to engage in tonight, that is, gathering to hear excerpts of the tale recited by a trained performer, that has been happening for almost as long. All of you are about to take part in a very venerable tradition. Although the Genji won the war, the Heike warriors and their families are the central figures in the tale. Having spent their lives in Kyoto, the highest ranking commanders and their wives and children had acquired courtly ways of dress, speech, and taste, including the cultivation of arts, such as music and the composition of waka poetry. They are presented in a highly sympathetic manner. What is the point of the tale of the age? Why was it written? Why was it recited? Why was it listened to? First, politically, it strongly suggests that the downfall of the Heike was inevitable and well-deserved. Therefore, it legitimizes what was then the current regime, the Genji government. Second, with regard to religion, the tale emphasizes the fleeting nature of power, wealth, and fame. It encourages us to abandon the pursuit of these things and to devote our efforts instead to the pursuit of the Buddhist way and to concern ourselves with the life to come. This life. The tale encourages compassion and remembrance of the dead. Indeed, one view holds that the tale was recited in order to pacify the spirits of the vanquished Heike warriors, lest they return to this world from the next to take revenge on their own enemies. In the modern age, the political concerns are irrelevant and the religious appeal is limited. The tale of the Heike is more often read silently that it is recited, and it's supposed to be recited. And it functions as an educational text and as a very refined form of entertainment in the manner of Greek tragedy. Moreover, the Heike is part of Japan's cultural capital. When Japan opened its doors to the West in the 19th century, in order to be taken seriously, it needed, among other things, an epic tradition that was equivalent to the works of Homer or Milton. And Heike, which had not been so highly celebrated up to that time, was pressed into service. It's a modern addition to the calendar. I have a spoiler alert. <laughs> I'm going to reveal some of the plot details of the excerpts you're about to hear so that they'll make better sense to you. But actually, like all classic literature and drama, which we pay rereading and reviewing, the appeal of the Heike lies not in plot twists but in its characterizations, its evocation of a lost world, and its emotional resonance. So I promise you, I'm not going to wreck it for you. The very first opening passage we'll hear sets the mood for the tale in the context of the impermanence of worldly desires, which is one of the central themes of medieval Japanese literature in general, and not just for the tale of the AK. We'll then proceed to the story of Nasuno Yoichi, one of the lighter moments in the tale, in which the Heike forces attempt to lure the great Genji commander, Yoshitsune, into arrow range by having one of their ladies display an open, fo open folding fan as a target for them to shoot at. This uh, briefly affords both sides the illusion that they are playing a friendly game instead of waging a brutal war. Such respite is rather rare in the tale. The rest of the scenes to be presented tonight are all drawn from the final defeat of the Heike forces at Danaura. Among them, the most shocking is the death by drowning of the child emperor, Anto. <coughs> Anto, whose mother was a lady of the Heike clan, and his father, the previous emperor, had died young. The person of the emperor, even a Heike descendant, was considered inviolable. But his maternal grandmother, who was also a Heike lady, was determined not to permit the Genji to capture him and turn him into their puppet 
for the rest of his natural life. She exhibits a tremendous capacity for spite and an extreme aversion to disgrace. Next, in the death of Moritsune, we will see an example of classic martial bravado. The samurai of Japan are famous for choosing death over surrender, and they are known especially for the method of self-disembowelment uh, called seppuku or haraki. This practice was actually just taking root among the samurai at this time, but it seems to have been originally a regional practice associated with the eastern warriors, that is the Genji, and they didn't lose that many battles. The Heike, who came from the west and were proficient in naval warfare, actually preferred to take their own lives by drowning. Regardless of the method, suicide was an optimal, rational choice for defeated warriors, as these people literally did not take prisoners. They typically executed their captives, sometimes after a period of humiliation or even torture. Through suicide, defeated warriors could exert some manner of control over their own deaths. They usually did it in such a way as to deprive their enemies of the satisfaction of decapitating them and displaying their heads as trophies, which was the custom. Noritsune maximizes his advantage of death by taking a few of the enemy with him. His colleague, Tomomori, is a different case. He takes his own life out of despair, not defiance, and he is not the only AK officer to do so. And I suggest you keep your ears open for this magnificent line. I have seen everything that is worth seeing. And finally, I'd like to give you a word about the text. Because the AK was originally orally transmitted, it's come to us in many, many different variants. And being an abridged collection of excerpts, the Japanese version that you'll hear tonight has, of course, been greatly shortened, but also edited lightly for clarity and for dramatic impact. And this puts it in a very long line of adaptations and recensions. The English supertitles were adapted and supplemented by me to match tonight's text. They're largely based on the excellent translation by Royal Tyler, which I highly, highly recommend to you. Uh, you would like to read the tale in its entirety in English. Thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for listening. Enjoy.